My name is Justin Reich. I'm a research fellow at Harvard X, just down the road. Um, I'm also a lecturer here in Eric's uh, Scheller Teacher Education Program, where I teach undergraduates who want to be 6 through 12 math and science teachers. Um, and I'm uh, a lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. We're in the fall. I'm teaching a class called Massive, the Future of Learning at Scale. Um, and uh, I've sort of immersed my, my original background as a ninth grade world history teacher um, and uh, spent a, a lot of time teaching in sort of blended hybrid kinds of environments and have been excited to see, um, you know, what's probably drawn me to this field more than anything else is just the incredible excitement that's happening around Harvard um, and MIT about teaching and learning in a way that sort of the like craziness of the MOOC hype with sort of all of its problems and all of its complications and difficulty has made it just a super exciting time at these institutions to be talking about teaching and learning. Um, I was asked to not talk for very long, um, and so that'll be my goal, is to really um, throw out some provocations of, of you know, what I, what I hope to have a conversation with you about is where do we think the field of open online learning research is right now? Um, what kinds of things are shaping that field? Um, what kinds of, you know, elements of the sociology of research production or the incentives in research production might be having us create certain kinds of things and not create other kinds? of things and particularly interested in what are the things that we could be doing or ought to be doing more of um, but we can't because there's not the right funding or there's not the right partnerships or there's not the right incentives or, or those kinds of things um, and in in um, in sharing all this you know I've sort of subtitled the talk um, uh, you know four types of MOOC research a, a pep talk to myself you know I don't mean to at all be claiming um, that I'm independent of those kinds of incentives or factors or you know I or we at Harvard X have been doing the right things um, what I really want to talk about is some of the, you know in some ways like some of the pressures that I feel and the directions that I feel sort of pushed to move into um, and and the places where I think there are sort of harder higher hills to climb that might be more rewarding if we were climbing them um, but ultimately you know it doesn't really matter what I think it would be great to try to have a conversation among everyone when we do when I stop provoking and we do get to have a conversation someone's going to be passing a mic around um, and they've been really, really, um, they've asked us as a community to be really good about passing the mic and making sure that we're talking into them so that the other people who are watching this later, all of whom are desperate to hear your ideas, um, can, uh, can hear them clearly. Um, I, I figure if I pander to your, uh, um, that's probably the way to do it. So what kinds of things isn't being done or isn't funded? Um, A-B testing, focus on community formation and social learning, personalized and adaptive learning are the most important directions, not enough research funded around scale and sustainability, comparisons of blended learning flipped models versus traditional classroom models versus traditional MOOC models, to the extent that there is a traditional MOOC. Um, what are, uh, I, went to the, I went to the University of Virginia and we had some saying which is like, if it happens once, it's a coincidence, if, it's, if it happens twice, if it's a tradition, and if it happens three times, Thomas Jefferson himself ordained. Um, that we all ought to be doing it. Um, design research and then collect data, not the other way around. Um, thoughtful research pose a hypothesis. Design course such that data can be collected to help answer that question. Um, a conversation about demand side, how are credits earned through MOOCs, uh, perceived cr credentials. Um, are we putting the cart before the horse? Scaling interactivity, having more research on exist based on the existing education literature with a concentration on what properly can't be studied in a small class. So that's sort of looking for areas where we can offer a kind of value add. Um, given online learning is a multidisciplinary endeavor, how do people from area A and area B get together to understand the funding landscape in each other's fields and to write fundable proposals? That's a great response, um, though not the question. You get an F. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what can we learn from the MOOC world to improve the educational experience on campus? What affordances does this new environment bring? How do we capitalize on the capabilities first? How applicable is MOOC research to traditional courses? Um, randomized controlled trials, not just from people who sort of own things, but from other places. What kind of learning is taking place? Um, better tools for instructors, qualitative research conversations with learners, good. Um, so th those are some of your ideas. Um, Here's, here's one of the ways that I would try to organize them. Um, so I've thought of MOOC research as happening in kind of four categories. Um, fishing in the exhaust, experiments in the periphery, observations in the field, and design research in the core. Um, and let me define these four pieces and talk about where I think our biases are. Um, so I think most, if, particularly over the first year, uh, I'm proving much more this year, a lot of the initial MOOC research has been what I would call fishing in the exhaust, sort of drawing on computer scientists' reference of the data streams that are admitted by systems 
um, as exhaust. Um, so someone made the comment about sort of running a bunch of courses and then doing, coming up with the questions to ask afterwards. Um, I think for a lot of good reasons, that's been the bulk of stuff that we've done. Um, some of the reasons that we do it are because it's really cheap um, and really easy. It's a lot easier to just you know, get a pile of data and start doing analyses on it than to develop partnerships with course teams in advance to be able to make uh, other kinds of opportunities available. Um, and you know you can also get results in some once the data is available you can get results pretty quickly out of that data um, I think there are some some limits on what kinds of causal inferences we can draw from these kinds of data in a lot of cases although there's lots of kind of exciting quasi experimental uh, efforts um, I also think that it's very very easy in our field to believe um, that the data that we have access to summarizes the full experience of what we're seeing. When you're looking at sort of a pile of big data, it's easy to believe, wow, we have you know, millions and millions of records. How could we not know everything that's happening? Um, but of course, you know, what, what we see people click is only a fraction of the experience that they're having, and it's often a proxy for the things that we care most about. Um, I would say the sort of next field which has been most kind of expanding from, from fishing in the exhaust kind of studies, which is what I spent most of my first year doing, um, with what I would call experiments in the periphery. And, I would, and I'm defining the periphery um, in terms of the experiences of the people who are developing the courses. So I would say most of the experiments that we have running in our Harvard X courses right now have a couple of qualities to them. So the first is that they're domain independent. Um, they're not capable of giving us insights about the science of learning in any particular discipline. We're not learning about, you know, core ideas in the instruction of biology or core ideas in the instruction of physics. We're looking at things you know, mostly about improving people's motivation and engagement um, that would extend across lots of different fields. So we're doing things like, um, there's a guy named Todd Rogers who has a really neat study buddy study um, where we get people to give us the email addresses and um, SMS numbers of uh, non-cohabitating friends and relatives. And we send them an email once a week that says something like, hey, Justin's taking the ancient Greek hero. And this week, he's been reading about how Oedipus gouged his eyes out. Um, why don't you ask him about that? Um, and then uh, so you basically sort of create these kind of conversational prompts to get non. It turns out it doesn't work particularly well with cohabitating relatives because um, your wife ha already has 99 things to nag you about and like the um, ed if edX is the hundredth it won't help you very much but your uncle doesn't have that many things to nag you about so if you get him to have these conversations um, these kinds of experiments typically require so, sometimes they're advertised as requiring no involvement at all from the faculty or the course developers so they're developed by some kind of third-party researcher they're designed to be applicable in any possible field and to be dropped into courses with sort of as little friction and energy as possible um, and I, you know, I think this characterizes actually quite a bit of, you know, I, I think part of the expansion of these things is because we're at a particular moment um, where we've had a lot of insights from social psychology, a lot of insights from behavioral economics. Um, you know, the sort of technocratic researchers have got super excited about nudging and priming and guiding and getting people to opt in and opt out and things like that. Um, and then if, you know, if you're someone who's been, who's been looking at a bunch of mindset interventions and you're thinking to yourself, man, you know, there's seven million teachers in the US. Like, it's a lot of work to go one at a time to seven million practicing teachers in the US and say, here's how you do this intervention, and here's the right language, and here's the wrong language, and here's what fidelity looks like. Um, it's super attractive to be able to say, oh, I'll just program this experiment into this platform, which reaches lots and lots of people. Um, you know, And the sort of sexiest of these experiments have uh, um, have, have seemed to take very little time. They seem to have lots of long-term impacts. You know, there's a whole lot of, fo and, you know, and if you're trying to get them funded, you sort of have this promise like it's gonna be cheap, it's gonna be, you know, have long-term downstream effects, um, and we can do it at scale because we have these platforms now that make it possible. Um, so if you, would, if you were to look at the portfolio um, of experimental research that we're doing at Harvard X, you know, which is sort of a growing field, almost all of them I would call experiments in the periphery in the sense that they don't have to do with either figuring, they don't really have to do with seeing if we can improve elements of disciplinary learning. In fact, in most cases, we don't even really use learning measures as an outcome at all. We use persistence or participation um, or certification or, or those kinds of things. Um, so I mean, I think in the next couple of years, we're going to be, have, see an explosion of that kind of research. And I think it's going to evince all kinds of really fascinating questions. Um, you know, One of the main ones really being 
Um, you know, what, what's the risk that we're accelerating learning experiences, which actually aren't that beneficial for people to begin with? Um, there's a great Yogi Berra quote, which is something like, we're lost, but we're making great time. Um, you know, like, <laughs> you know, I mean, if we don't believe, you know, if we're not sure that a learning experience is providing meaningful learning opportunities for people, is it ethical to be accelerating their participation in it? And then I think there's a whole bunch of great, like if there's a gazillion researchers and platform developers who have all gotten certain, like super excited about embedding nudges and primes and these other kinds of things like how are they all going to interact with each other what's going to happen out over years when students get exposed to these kinds of things over and over again what kinds of diminishing effects will we have um, so I think there are a lot of good questions to be asked there um, I would say in, uh, again I, you know I think our portfolio of research at Harvard X is not that different from what I see sort of happening broadly in the field but if people disagree with me I'll be excited to hear that um, this uh, um, so one category of, of, of research that I see very little of are observations in the field, um, trying to find out um, qualitatively. I think we've done, a, a, there's a lot more kind of survey research that's happening, but in terms of trying to understand what are the experiences that learners are having, particularly things that we can't capture um, on our platforms. Let me skip 90% of what I was going to show you because it's not that interesting. Um, I'll go back to some of it. There, here's, we're lost from wearing time. Um, so, here, so, so here's, a, here's a series of figures that we've been producing that we think are kind of interesting. So on the x-axis um, is each video in one of our courses. So this particular course had 297 videos or something like that. And on the x-axis, they're numbered from 1 to 297. Um, the light gray line is the number of people who started the video. The, the black gray line is the number of people who finished the video. Um, the red line going across is the number of people who earned a certificate. Um, so one of the things you can see there is that by about a fifth of the way through the course, you see the intersection of the number of people who finished watching the video, each video and the number of people who earned a certificate. Um, I think you could see this pattern. In, I mean, this was a pattern that I noticed from the very first MOOCs that were offered. Like if you went to 6002X um, and looked at the very, very, you know, they got you know, 7,000 or so people earned a certificate. If you looked at the last dozen or so videos, there are three or 400 people who are watching those videos. Um, not every course that we have has this pattern, but an awful lot of them do. Um, you know, the other thing that I would say is that a, a certificate earner is a pretty, con you know, conceivably a conservative estimate of the number of people that we think ought to be watching a video. We have about, you know, about as many people who are engaging in sort of auditing-like behaviors, um, trying to learn from experience without doing assessments as we do who are certificate earners. So, you, so I mean, you can, the, the red line is just a reference for like, how many people should be watching these videos? And you can move it up and down based on all kinds of things that you believe. Um, but I think it's pretty hard to dispute that there seems to be a pretty huge gap between the number of people who we think ought to be watching these things and the number of people who are, which raises a bunch of questions like, so okay, how are you learning this stuff? Um, some people might be downloading transcripts, and right now edX doesn't pick up that event, so we're missing that. Um, some people might be reading the textbook that's associated with it. Um, some people might be talking to their friends. Some people might be banging their heads against problems and just figuring it out on their own. Um, some people might be looking for, you know, I had a student who I once interviewed about her learning activities in college courses, and she said, I think most of my lectures are terrible. I sit and I listen to them, and I write down keywords, and I look them up in Wikipedia later. Um, and uh, that might very well be a pattern of practice. Um, but all of the kinds of learning experiences that, or, or I think there's a whole suite of learning, this suggests to me that there's a whole suite of learning practices that we're not capturing or understanding on the platform, um, and that one of the most effective ways to learn about them would be to pick up the phone or, or get on Skype and talk to a bunch of these people and say, explain to us your learning behaviors. You know, and this sort of is a proposal for, you know, there's a niche of people that I'm most interested. Who are the folks who are finishing courses, you know, engaging with less than 25% of the learning materials that we, that we think they ought to be engaging with? And what kinds of things are they doing? And how can we figure more, more out about this? Um, so uh, this to me is sort of like a particular prompt of there's a whole bunch of learning behaviors that are happening maybe online, but, uh, uh, but off platform and maybe sort of in the real world entirely. Um, I had a colleague, uh, Remy Mansfield, who's now at edX, who helped me do a, a few initial interviews this past year. And one of the things he was tapping into was people's help-seeking behavior. Um, what kinds of things do people do when they're looking for more help? And he found some people, you know, these are all idiosyncratic, one-off kinds of things, but people who like basically got people together for drinks on Friday nights, who had expertise in the area that they were taking and sort of creating these social events um, where they could learn from the other people around them. Um, people who are talking about, you know, what kinds of resources they had in their networks that were 
social capital that could support them um, that we'd be totally blind to. Um, so I think, um, you know, I think there's huge promise in, and, and I think it's hugely important for us to do some of this kind of observational um, research. And the, you know, and it's interesting to me to start thinking about, you know, why aren't there why aren't there more mixed methods kinds of studies? Why aren't there more opportunities for um, us to really think about what kinds of things are happening um, that that the platform will never pick up on? Um, and then to me, what I think the hardest kinds of research to make happen um, in our field, certainly to make happen in Harvard X, are, are what I call design research in, in the core. Um, and this is research experiences where we're trying to use as outcomes the most important learning outcomes of the course, no matter how difficult or hard they are to measure, and where we're testing the most important pedagogical propositions that an instructor brings to a course. Um, that uh, Research that has the potential not just to sort of advance the science of motivation and engagement, but to advance the disciplinary science of learning um, in particular domains. There are a number of reasons why this is super hard, and I think uh, Rick Clark this morning alluded to some of them. So one of the reasons is it really does require multidisciplinary teams. Um, and it requires these multidisciplinary teams working together under really difficult circumstances. So most of the, you know, I would say Harvard X may be, maybe there are other places that are like this, but, but my office, I have this sort of little glass wall and a door, and right out in front of me are two tables full of course developers. You know, like I can throw things at them if I want to talk to them. They're, they're right next to me. Um, but, they, but they are incredibly, time constrained and having, you know, they have a lot of pressure to put together these enormous courses under relatively short time frames. Um, they're super interested in doing research, but asking them and particularly asking their faculty members to be involved in the research design process from the very, very beginning, you know, one of the things that Rick pointed out is that for, you know, working with a lot of instructors, you know, asking the question, what are your learning objectives? One of your learning outcomes. Um, my, my colleague, Sergi Nesterko, used to joke that, that sometimes we'd ask these questions of faculty and it was like you were sort of talking to a wounded artist or something like that. Like, what do you mean the learning objectives? I will teach. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was not just European <laughs> faculty who did that. The full range of, of uh, people who did that. Um, but, uh, um, you know, and so going from there to, okay, you know, what instruments do we have to measure that? If we don't have the instruments to measure that, um, how will we change it? You know, one of the things that's been fun for me over the last year is seeing faculty thinking about what their learning objectives are really evolve. Um, so I would say, you know, particularly strongly, say, in the sciences, um, we found that, you know, if you asked a lot of science faculty why they were teaching the beginning of the course, you know, they would say things like, well, I teach fundamentals of neurobiology, and here are some things you need to know at the fundamentals of neurobiology. If you, if you talk to them about a year into it, they, a lot of them say more things like, look, I know the vast majority of these students, unlike my Harvard students, are not going to go on to be neurobiologists. What I'm really interested in is figuring out if I can help them better understand the scientific method, if I can help them appreciate and be critical consumers of science news media, if I can help them you know, increase their public support, their, their support for the public funding of science, that they basically have as many kind of behavioral affective outcomes that they have from their course, sort of social justice kinds of outcomes. There's a course we're about to launch on education policy. Um, where I think the professor cares a little bit about whether or not they leave knowing what No Child Left Behind is um, and knowing some basic kind of public policy theory. I think he cares a ton if they leave the course knowing who their school board reps are, if they go and vote in their local election next time, if they pay attention to community issues. Um, there's a whole research on civic education that I think could give us some insights about how we could start measuring some of those kinds of behaviors that are, that are really more behavioral than effective in nature. Um, but I think, there are, I think doing that work has a whole series of challenges. Um, it involves this kind of coordination. In a ton of fields, it involves developing new kinds of assessments and measures. Um, it involves making substantial changes to the architecture of courses and conceivably not just A-B testing, like, you know, oh, what if we make the button really big or what if we put the hint before or after the problem, but things like, you know, so, so here's one from Introduction to Computer Science. Um, CS50X from Harvard starts with a unit on Scratch, starts with a unit on block-based programming um, that doesn't require syntax or language. You just sort of drag bits of code together to program. They don't really know whether or not it's a good idea to introduce programming using block-based programming languages. Um, it would be almost, the only way you could test it sort of, you can't, 
A-B test kids at Harvard because they're a little sensitive to these kinds of things. Um, and so you could sort of over many multiple years um, offer different kinds of curriculum. But one of the things that we could do in CS50 if we had enough time, if we had enough resources, was launch people into, you know, randomly assign them to two different courses, one that starts with block-based programming and one that doesn't, and say we genuinely don't know which of these approaches is better. So neither of you are getting, you know, we'll know pretty soon if one of these is better than the other. Um, but at the moment, we don't. There's one course that did that. So Copyright X um, was, a, was sort of a Spock kind of an application course with 500 people where they had one course that was mostly a globally focused curriculum and another course that was mostly a US focused curriculum. Um, and they randomly assigned students to these two conditions. At the end of it, they decided they did a better job teaching the US focused curriculum that even students from overseas preferred having a coherent introduction to one intellectual property regime than trying to figure out what was going on across the world. Um, but obviously, you know, I think that also gives a hint of kind of the difficulty of some of these sorts of challenges, building two entirely different courses, training your TFs to run two entirely different courses. Um, but ultimately, I think that's where, uh, I, th I think particularly if we want to do more than advance kind of the, the science of motivation and engagement, but really, you know, to advance the science of disciplinary learning, we're going to have to do these kinds of experiments that closely involve content experts. Um, some of the things that I think disincentivize that in addition um, are, are all of that kind of design work um, takes much, much longer to do um, than grabbing a data set and looking at it afterwards um, or coming up with an experiment, which even if the sort of smaller experiments in the periphery take less time, you can drop them into four or five or six or seven different kinds of courses um, and, uh, and get more data and more results that way. Um, and I don't think there's nearly as much you know, I don't think there's. New, I, th I think this, I think this is an area um, where people who have the power to control incentive systems might be able to make a real impact. Like if I was a funder in this space right now, I would be thinking, you know, how can I fund this kind of design research in the core, which a young postdoc is much less likely to decide to voluntarily engage in if they're competing against other young postdocs um, who are going to focus on sort of cranking out papers that they can with the data sets that are available. Um, or how if I was a person who was a managing course development in a university. How could I get, how could I prioritize you know letting people put their courses on edX if they agree to make research design a kind of fundamental part of the architecture of the course and not something that you can kind of choose to do if you want to um, in year two or year three? Um, one of the ways that you might so to summarize some of this, to, to put some of these things on some dimensional scales, and then I'll stop and let people talk about whatever we want to talk about, um, is to say that I think if you look at a lot of the research that comes out of the, you know, and tons of which, which, which I've done and I'm fully participating in, and I think was useful for lots of reasons, I think a lot of the fishing in the exhaust, um, well, we say, you know, on, on the left-right axis here is from more observational research to more causal research, or at least research in which it's easier to draw causal inferences, although there's all kinds of clever things that you knew. And then sort of borrowing Geertz and other people who, who don't know what to use and sort of use as crutch words this idea of thin and thick, um, the idea that, that, uh, that, there, that there are certain kinds of research that we can do that has much more texture, um, and in particular has much richer context about the learner and much richer context about the particular course and about the particular conditions. Um, and I would say, you know, my read of the field um, is that we spent a lot of time in the top left corner. Um, and we're sort of moving to the top right corner. Um, and I'm really excited um, to think about ways um, that, that, we can, that we can particularly figure out how to move into the bottom right corner. How can we try to do more work um, that really understands the context of the learner, that really understands the context of the course, that asks the hardest questions that we can possibly ask um, about, the, about disciplinary learning and advancing disciplinary learning. Um, and, uh, you know, and incentivize people to take on those kinds of toughest challenges. Um, but that's my read, and you all might have totally different things to say. So why don't I stop? Um, and uh, you've heard, for, I can sort of put back up here. I think we have a microphone. Um, you've heard what some other folks think are sort of the more important things to talk about. I took the opportunity to have sort of the first words about that. The other thing that I'll say, so two things, please do talk into the microphone um, and I'll try to facilitate in a way that unless, that, that I don't need to answer the questions. Other people, we can just have a conversation among the people in the room that I don't have to respond particularly to any of it. Hi, I'm Ursula Wolves. Um, my background is, is rich and varied and one of the things that I did do is I went on a dog and pony show with Dave Mallon about teaching scratch first. And so there is published literature on the fact that teaching scratch first works better. And it's based on a model that, or a context that I don't know that I'm happy with, is that what we looked at is retention, and we also looked at 
whether it was attracting a, di a more diverse audience. And um, let me put this from the, from the trenches. The way that we did it, and a special interest group for, SIG for computer science education conference at a SIGSI conference, is that David got up and he said, I did two weeks of scratch, and then I taught Harvard major C. Um, and then Henry, whose last name I've lost, because I haven't seen him in about five years, he got up and said, well, I do this at Harvard with Java. And everybody, everybody in the audience is from, from middle tier and, and, and small colleges and community colleges, and they're all going, yeah, that's Harvard. And then I would get up and say, and I'm doing it at the College of New Jersey, and they all go, okay, this is doable. And so what we have is a body of anecdotal evidence through interviews of people who have tried this and it's been successful. Um, I love your, your paradigm is wonderful because I've been an observer in the field. And my dilemma is that I have good results of using, of, of teaching online courses of my own design. Um, I have um, a little jury rig platform that I use in, in, in Google <coughs> sites because I can't use Blackboard because I'm dyslexic and Blackboard is not supportive of people who reverse things easily. Uh -huh. um, and I've also used um, MOOCs in my classes. I can't share any of that with you guys formally because I never got an IRB approval to ask my students or even track my students or even collect their data. Okay, so I, I'd, li I'd like this conversation to be a little bit about that, is how can you bring more of us into the conversation about what data is valuable? Okay. Now, you still have a good research question because David and Henry and about two dozen of us know that if you start with a syntax-free language and then move into a formal programming language, you will get amazing results and more to the point, you will get more non-white males to stay in the courses and take the next course. Mark Guzdal's built his career on that concept. Good. But how, how do the rest of us engage in this? In a way, you know, we don't have the research funding to do it. We don't even have the mandate to do it. And we certainly don't have the ability to, to work through an IRB and do everything we need to do to set up a clean experiment. No, really good, really good questions. I don't know if people want to respond to that or. <laughs> Which is a rare event. Um, so I guess I would disagree a little bit that an IRB is a tough thing to get because this technically, yeah, I mean, IRBs are, uh, uh, you know, they're not anybody's idea of fun, but, <laughs> or if, yeah. But, um, you know, this, would, this falls under educational research, so you can get really sort of very easy exemptions. Um, so you don't, it's not like doing a, a, an intervention with, you know, a medication. Um, so, so we get, why don't we let her finish because she's got the microphone and people won't hear you. Yeah, so, um, so I mean, in some ways that gets to the motivation piece, right, to the persistence piece, to the grit or stick to of what we're doing. So when you're doing your um, curriculum design, if what you think you're going to do is educational research, then you build that into your structure before you do it. So one right? of the things it's a that purposeful we're thing. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So one of the things that we're trying to do institutionally at Harvard X is number one, have really close relationships with our institutional review board. We basically, you know, we have an institutional review board member who comes to all of our meetings. We meet with her pretty regularly. Um, a second thing we do is to try to build structures that, you know, that push the limit of um, making our protocols as applicable to as many courses as possible and extended over time as possible. And obviously IRBs try to reduce that to some extent so there's some tension. But for instance, for some of the interview research we've done, we've tried to set things up um, so that, uh, you know, and it, it, by default in all of our pre-course surveys, we ask people to opt in to being interviewed. Um, and so that's at least one initial step of we have a sort of solicitation that's out there. We try to have sort of, you know, default IRBs that allow us to, um, I, th I think, trying to think ahead of what, what are the kinds of research that somebody might at some point want to do um, and try to make it possible right. to. So, so to me, there are two issues, right, which is how do you operationalize your research project, right? I need an IRB. I need this. I need these, right? And how do you connect people in your institution to, to do that type of work? Mm -hmm. And I think the one thing that people forget about is to look outside of whatever school you live in, right? So for me, um, I am partnering with people in the School of Informatics and people in the um, School of Education. And, you know, so it takes a little bit of effort, but it's amazing how many people want to do this type of work. Third point graduate students, summer research students, folks are hungry for the opportunity and they will help you. Like you don't have to do it all yourself. Yeah, no, great. I think Neil had a question that was in the back and then Eric. I, 
Hi, uh, Neil Efferman, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Um, the um, I was going to actually um, I was going to actually say, oh, I hate your title where we actually talk about experiments in the periphery, right? Because we want to actually run those experiments in the core. But I now recognize that, oh, you're just kind of saying, well, lots of them that have been done right now have been in the periphery, and you'd want to actually get them in the core. Because as a guy that actually loves to actually publish randomized control trials and thinks of himself as an education researcher, I'm like, that's the whole point. That's what's going to be really important in this MOOC stuff, OK, is what do we actually learn about human learning, and how can we use it to actually do that? Um, on the IRB thing, um, so we just recently got an NSF actually award to actually help 100 researchers run studies inside our platform. Our IRB is probably un pretty unique. Uh, it's actually not unique. Actually, OLI actually does the exact same thing. You know, our platform and edX, maybe actually, maybe you could speak to this issue. Um, but actually, uh, if you want to do a study inside our platform with 60,000 kids, uh, you need to get IRB to actually look at anonymized data. Um, and we don't actually do like discussion board stuff, so it's kind of easy for us to anonymize data. Uh, uh, but actually, we are actually run your study under normal instructional practice. Uh, we don't need any parent consent, and we work on 13-year-olds, right? Uh, and so it's really important to actually understand the IRB context, given that. Can you state, actually, under what circumstances does actually a edX or Harvard X class actually get um, uh, qualify under normal instructional practices such that actually no one needs to actually sign into something? Or does that never happen at Harvard X? No, it, so um, all the decisions are made at the, har at the school level rather than the edX level. Um, because different schools have different institutional review boards that could decide these things differently. Uh, you know, everything we do gets reviewed by an institutional review board, um, but we don't have signed consent from our participants. Um, so we, uh, we basically say that the, for most kinds of things that we're doing that look an awful lot like typical instructional practice, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna, even if we're doing some experimental stuff, we're gonna give you your readings over three pages instead of one page. We're gonna, you know, make a few kinds of changes like that. Um, we just refer people to the edX terms of service and the privacy policy. There's probably better ways that we could do that, but that's what we're doing for now and works. For some of the things where we give people, put people in experimental conditions where they might experience substantially different curricula, we basically put it in the syllabus and make a bunch of announcements beforehand. Like if you had taken that copyright X class, you, you would have to be pretty oblivious to not realize that there were a couple of different classes going on and you were only going to be in one of them and you were discouraged from talking to the other one and things like that. So we, you know, we work pretty closely. We do get X expedited um, kinds of reviews, um, but everything does have to have a protocol that's written up and does go through there. Other institutions could settle things very differently. I mean, that's one of the sort of funny parts of our federated um, IRB system. I think Eric had the, had the next. Uh, but you know, maybe one meta point to talk about the two things that we've been talking about is, um, you know, to what extent can institutions build institution? You know, it sounds like some of the barriers that we run into are sort of common institutional structures. Um, how do we make it easy for people to get through the IRB? How do we make it easy for multidisciplinary researchers to connect with each other? How do we make it easy for graduate students to find um, projects? You know, for on the last one, we borrowed a lot of ideas from the Lytx Lab at Stanford and the way that they've sort of built community over there, and we at Harvard X are trying to do the same thing. Um, of, uh, of pulling in resources. Um, so that seems like one theme of, of obstacles that we might work on collectively. So Eric Klopp for MIT. Um, so I wanted to, to the, your, your bottom two quadrants of your, uh, of your original slide, not that one, but that one, yes. So the observations in the field and design research in the core. So I, I'd like to argue that design research in the core is only useful if it's accompanied by observations in the field. Um, th look, so thinking of your Scratch example and the Scratch example there, um, so if you just compare Scratch versus Python or some or Scratch versus Java, um, you don't necessarily learn that much other than that those two particular choices are better or worse than another for certain kinds of students. Um, but if you actually do a, the observations in the field accompanied with those, you can understand, well, maybe Scratch is better because it's block space, as you proposed. Or maybe it's the community aspects. Or maybe it's the graphical nature of it. Or maybe it's the community aspects. There's lots of different things that are, that are different about those two things. And you might decide that some of them are more important to people than others and be able to ultimately design better things for, for people through being able to get some of that, that observations in the field. So how do you, how do you sort of think about, I, that was those two, but are they, is there more of sort of like a, an ecosystem of these things that exists where they, they, they really only are good when they sort of accompany each other? 
Yeah, I, I would say one reason why I use sort of experiments in the top right and design research in the bottom right is to just sort of subversively suggest that like if what we think of as experiments, which is not what a lot of really experienced learning scientists, you know, Neil and Eric and other folks are thinking about, if we think about them as sort of flipping A-B tests, like, you know, you make the blue button and you make the red button and you just see which works better, um, I don't think that kind of approach is as powerful as being really informed by theory. And, and also I think your point is exactly right that often that, that you know, we think of randomized controlled trials as kind of the gold standard of research, but they're the gold standard of comparative efficacy research. Like if you want to know if A is better than B, this might help you. But if you want to know why A was better for some people than B, then you often have to talk to students and find out about their experiences. Some of that, you know, I think we can get out of fishing in the exhaust. I think some of the things we might be able to say, wow, these quick, 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 click streams logs might really illuminate the kinds of work we're doing, as well as these interviews, as well as these surveys, as well as what people type when we look at the discussion forms and things like that. So to me, I mean, you know, I'm obviously influenced by your work and other folks, but my sense is the people who have been, you know, learning scientists who've been working on this for a long time at the intersection of education and technology um, have, you know, see A-B testing as one important tool, but as you eloquently described, in the context of a bunch of other strategies, particularly to figure out why things are operating the way they're operating. And because they operate differently in different, I mean, this is why I also have a bias towards domain-specific things, because I think oftentimes Times those contexts differ quite a bit from one environment to another, um, and understanding how they operate in a particular field is important. Um, although, you know, some of my colleagues who are, um, you know, cognitive scientists and experimental psychologists get super excited about the sort of universality of human cognition, um, you know, and they have a great case to make that if you find things that work for all of our shared monkey brains, then like that's something that can be uh, used in lots of different contexts. So, no, I think that's a that's a great point, and hopefully helps explicate my language there a little bit. Other people have other thoughts or questions or things to put back on? Or other things that you think you ought to be doing, some, some, a fifth kind of MOOC research that we're, that we're not doing? I, I'm curious, on, uh, you know, when it comes to like completion rates and engagement, um, a lot of the, you know, a lot of us are interested in how, you know, are kind of disappointed with where things are at and, you know, are looking at ways of how to improve those metrics. Have you guys done any work where you looked and, and, and sort of how the students feel about it? Like, do the ones that make it further, are they happier? Or, you know, the ones that don't, do they care? Like, does it matter? So the, so the ones who make it, I mean, this is, I think, a great question of you're saying, you know, what, are, what, are, what kinds of observations can we do of people who persist at different lengths throughout the course? Um, one of the challenges that we had is, you know, we, we thought we were all clever at Harvard X this year, and we're like, oh, we'll do, you know, people haven't been really doing a lot of post-course surveys. Let's do a, you know, some consistent post-course surveys. So we send out these course evaluations at the end of the course. About, like, 1.5% of people respond to them. They're the 1.5 happiest, most satisfied, you know, people who have persisted through all of these challenges and they're filling out our nth survey for them. They, you know, in some ways, these documents are incredibly useful because you know, satisfaction is a 4.9 out of 5. Overall learning is a 4.9 out of 5. You can hand these things to the faculty, you know, and, and they will, you know, even the social scientists will conveniently like, ignore the bias that's sort of totally obvious. Like, you had 90,000 people in this course, and here's 600 surveys that all say you're great. You know, and the result is, yeah, I am great. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but one of the things, I mean, I think this is where lots of people can partner. So, you know, there's uh, Sharif Halawa and probably other people um, at Stanford and other places who've been working on trying to predict dropout. Um, you know, how do you tell the difference between someone who's going to take a break for a week or a break for two weeks and someone who's really done? Um, trying to find the people at the moment, that as close to the moment as we can to when they're done to get their course evaluation then and to figure out, um, you know, I've just submitted something which was, I mean, it's okay to ask the question, um, you know, what, one thing we've gotten better at is figuring out what kinds of intentions people have when they come to the course. But if we really want to understand completion rates, we got to understand why, why did they leave. Um, you know, there's, there's some unknown percentage that's probably pretty consistent across courses of people who leave because stuff like came up in their lives. And there's probably, you know, there's probably some natural ceiling. Um, but I would say that, you know, the one concern I have about all of that, and I think Rick talked about this earlier, I think there's a lot of good physics research behind that. There are lots of learning experiences that we provide to people um, which do not benefit them. Um, and so uh, unless, um, you know, I mean, I think all the stuff that sort of came out of the research with the force concept inventory and all these ideas that people, you know, people could get A's in physics at Harvard um, and have very little change. You know, as Rick said this morning, you can, be a, you can be a worst physicist when you leave one of these courses, even if you've done really well. Um, so I think having, 
having an entire focus on engagement and completion rate, I think there are some good reasons to do it, and we participate in that work and get excited about it. But I think if we don't have more of a focus on our students actually learning, um, you know, if we, because there may be some trade-offs there. We may find that you could do things that increase the amount of learning that people do that also increase your um, dropout rate, but that still might be worth it to get the folks learning who you want to be learning. Um, that to me is like one of the big missing holes um, that, uh, you know, I think Dave Pritchard is doing terrific work in this area where he's really trying to use a bunch of well-validated instruments, use a bunch of well-validated concept inventories so he can make some claims, not just about you know, X percent of people finished my course, but I think they learned this much. Um, which in lot, you know, in some, and this is harder in some fields than others. You know, we have this course, The Ancient Greek Hero, where the essential question is, what does it mean to be human? Um, like, that's a tough one to, you know, write multiple choice questions around and things like that. Um, but, uh, but I also don't think it's, I'm, you know, I'm not, a, I mean, I was a history teacher, and so I'm a humanist at heart, but I'm not, you know, I'm not one to sort of throw my hands up in the air and say, oh, it's impossible to measure. Like, there's got to be some things that we can get in there. I could talk about more of them. Someone out here had the... Um, hi, um, my name is El Wang from Columbia Teachers College. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I have an open general question to the audience also. Um, I wanted to know that as a researcher and instructor myself, um, I want to know why do we care about what kind of research we wanted to do and what exactly is our goal? Like, do faculty members really care about improving completion rates if the course is you know, free and open access? If it's offered again, what's the significance of improving their completion rates? And what is the significance of making students happier even? Um, and from a research point of view, do we, want, do we just want to you know, explore the data and to know whatever we did not know before, or do we, as researchers, maybe you're rep representing edX Coursera, you're representing um, a department institution. What, what are some of our goals we want to you know, try to explore rather than just you know, faced with the huge excitement of this you know, MOOC thing, the data, and everything? Just really open question here. Yeah, yeah. And we also have a um, panel uh, at 2 o'clock on motivation and <laughs> engagement. So. Great. I don't, does anybody want to respond to anybody who hasn't shared anything? Emily, do you want to, or uh, oh, yeah, sure. a couple of replies from people who haven't? Uh, yeah, I, I would just add to that by saying, you know, if it's not generalizable to a context where the rest of us can be making better use of it, I think, I think your point is really well taken, and it's a question that I've had the last couple of days as well. So I appreciate you asking that. Can, would, you, would you say more, even more specifically, what, I think I know what you mean by that. Well, you, you know, I, the, the fact that you've got a very specific kind of an audience that's engaged in these MOOCs, the fact that um, they've got particular, their own particular goals or lack of goals in these MOOCs um, as compared to, um, you know, we're very interested in, in exactly the same what, kinds what of questions. What context are you coming from? Uh, I'm sorry, University System of Maryland. Um, I'm the director of a center there at the system level for academic innovation. And of course, we're very interested in understanding the answers to these questions for our students who are engaged in credit-bearing courses who desperately need increased access, increased availability of these courses. We want them to be able to, to, to benefit from these sorts of things. So we're interested in the answers to those questions, but in a, in a somewhat different context. Yeah, so the opportunity cost of your students is another, Emily might be the next person. The opportunity cost for your students is another, they might take another course. They might, you know, the opportunity for, uh, cost for most of our students is like they'll go and watch The Wire um, or other kinds of things like that. Um, so they're, you know, do, 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 student, do students who are, you know, probably mostly affluent for the for sure, mostly, you know, already degreed students, already successful autodidacts are the kinds of things that we're learning in these environments applicable to other settings and in what kinds of ways and how can we test that? And, you know, I think it gets back to one of, one of the people who, who added to the uh, poll before, it sort of raised this idea of like what's, and it connects to this, like what's the particular value out of this research? Like what could we be doing that can't be done in other kinds of contexts, which would be an interesting thing for folks to riff on. Um, yeah, I guess I can just say quickly sort of some of the stuff I was thinking sort of, I've already said, but that for me, the sort of design is always the reason that we're doing this work, and it's designed both on the pedagogical side and the technology side, and I think it's um, for, for a lot of the tools that we've been using in classrooms and in distance learning set settings are somewhat limited compared to sort of what the, the entire internet has invented in the last 10, 15 <laughs> years, um, and so I think one 
thing that's really interesting about MOOCs is sort of what it what it draws from how the web does things broadly at, at scale with some, a little bit maybe more interactivity um, with what we're doing in more traditional classrooms. And I think when we're we know more about who these students are, what's holding them back, and what's not, and if there are some things that are more generalizable in terms of say you know, learning strategies or social supports that we can then adapt into the platform or into different types of technologies, um, then that might, that's, that's a reason to, to, to do this work to understand these contexts and understand how these contexts are different than other contexts and whether those differences are salient or not for the design choices that we're making. Because they might not be, and, and they may be, but that's what we have to keep comparing and looking outside of this particular zone. Tim, do you want to go ahead and then? Uh... Yeah, go ahead, Tim. No, I'm oh, so we'll see you want to do And then you can go next, Tim. Thanks. So um, a couple of thoughts that harken back to the talk this morning is um, I really would encourage us to think about the educational literature. So sort of why to do this scholarship, you know, Ernest Boyer many moons ago talked about the different types of scholarship and the different types of, of you know, um, how do you approach it? So it's not just like, did you like my class, right? Um, it's it's what's the purpose and, and, and why do we do it? So people may want to look at that work be before trying to reinvent the wheel. The other thing I think about in terms of how to do this research or at what level, if you think of this as a drug trial, right? So it's a drug intervention, i.e. a massive online learning experiment. Um, and you have phase one trials where are we going to kill anybody with it? Okay, no, we're still in phase one right now. We're not killing anybody, right? Then the next trial is sort of a phase two. Well, what's the best dose and how many and how long and, how, and for how, you know? And then you move forward into in what situations, in which population, which group does this, um, does this intervention work best in? Um, it, it's just a different way to frame it for yourself so that, that we all just don't feel like we're whistling in the dark, right? Because this really is, there is a science behind it. And if we think about it purposefully like that, I think that will help guide us. Um, you know, you guys all talk about A-B testing and I actually, I'm like, oh, that's a randomized controlled trial. <laughs> that's just, it's just an RCT. And so if you think about, if we, if we put it in that context, that may help us uh, frame our questions. That's great. Tim, did you have uh, on something else or anything else you want to talk about? <coughs> Yeah, I want to come back to the implementation of research from the from the start and from the core. So um, yeah, I'm working for a European MOOC platform, and um, I mean we already have some research st stuff like A/B testing. We have surveys. You can implement a lot of stuff to the courses. Most instructors don't. So the question would be, but is it a problem from the instructors, or are there really tools um, missing uh, on on MOOC platforms that should be implemented? Without them, um, research cannot be conducted. Um, I'm a computer scientist, I'm, I'm not a learning scientist, and that was a deliberate decision back in the dark ages, but I was a research assistant in the MIT Logo Lab, and the one study that came out of, out of that project, which has had an influence on, on so much computing education, um, was, it was the Brookline Project, and this was my role, and again, this was back in the dark ages, and I'm, I'm, let me preface this with, I challenge the learning scientists and the, and the instructional technologists in the room to really think hard about how you can create better observational tools in the MOOC environments. This was my job, okay? We had four computers and four kids in 1978. This was unheard of. And what we had was something called a dribble file. You guys call it a click record, okay? My job was to sit in the back of the classroom while Dan Watt, a brilliant teacher, worked with four children. And I took notes furiously with paper and pencil because we didn't have any of this cool technology of what was going on in the classroom. And then after they all cleared out and the school shut down and I had finished hacking Scratch, uh, Logo because I loved it as, as a tool to play with, I would print out the dribble files. And I was required before I went home at night, I didn't always do that, but before I went home at night, I had to annotate the dribble files and explain what was going on there. And we had an incredible rich body of information about what the kids were doing on the computer and what the kids were doing off. I don't know how you translate that into 
to 21st century so we, research. So, so we, have a, uh, we have an IRB protocol that I haven't found any students to work on yet, but our idea for that is basically to sort of borrow, for instance, some of the work that like Sam Weinberg has done at Stanford on think alouds and things like that, where we, we, we have everything in place to be able to invite um, our students to do an interview with us, and then after doing an interview with us, to do a study session um, where they broadcast their study session with us through Skype or Google Hangout, and we record it. Um, and so it's one way of starting to figure out, like, okay, so what are they doing off platform? Like, who are the people who wander behind them and ask them questions? Like, what does it look like? And how noisy is the coffee shop they're in? Are they in their classroom? Are they in their schools? Um, and then it would, you know, it wouldn't be hard at all for us to sort of timestamp those video records and correlate those video records to the to the transcripts and to see what they were actually doing on the platform and things like that. I think there's a whole there's a whole bunch of stuff that we could learn by directly ob observing people's practices, either doing what you did, which was observing people's practices, sort of totally naturalistically, totally at a distance, saying just you know. Do whatever you're doing, and we'll watch you to the extent that you can. You know, something is unchanged when it's watched, which is not. Um, but the other thing we were thinking about is also asking people um, to think aloud as they're doing some of these practices to talk to us out loud and say, you know, what are you thinking? Why did you make that choice? Just keep sort of narrating what you're doing. Um, so you know, some of these things are, um, you know, and I would say you know, part of the part of the challenge for um, it would it would be. I mean, I, I I don't know how this is across other kinds of institutions, but it, there's definitely. You know, I, th I think some of it is just trying to convince people to raise the value of that kind of research um, and say that we can do all the sort of fancy things we want with log files, but that our view of them may be really incomplete unless we get some of those other kinds of things. Teppo, do you want to? Uh, Teppo, Joe Tennis from Medic. So uh, talking about the question of how do we, when we have these fancy tools, how do we as faculty to use them? We definitely... Uh, uh, wrestle with this challenge and one of the things we've started to learn and hear feedback from is actionable things that there are some faculty who really want to do research for the sake of it and especially those who have background in it earlier are somehow related to learning sciences but we've heard from many more people that if we are able to give them analytics tests that they can in quick succession somehow use to modify their teaching or add uh, other interventions in discussion forums or by email that they would use them more. So that's at least something that we are then now furiously thinking about that how can we quickly give something that's actionable and we are hopeful that that will get people started, put their toe in the water and then maybe do more and more. I think that's a great suggestion, sort of thinking about research design, thinking about how do you, how do you make your, re sure your, your research design has intermediate conclusions that come quickly enough for faculty to be able to do something with it. So when you're pitching it to them, um, you can say, don't just do this you know, for the good of humanity when we figure out this a year from now, but uh, you know, we'll have things set up so that in four weeks we'll be, or two weeks or whatever it is, we'll be able to give you some sort of suggestion. Yeah, I suppose one other thing to mention is uh, the value of uh, not just, I mean, A-B testing sort of implies that there's an A and a B, uh, but very often uh, Kurt Lewin basically brought us the two by two where you vary, uh, where you vary two factors. And why is, why is that so important? Well, it's so important because it helps you figure out the why question, which, which Susan told us at the very beginning of this conference is so important to figure out. Uh, and so that gets difficult sometimes because of the, the sample size, uh, especially when you do it a little bit later in the MOOC, uh, especially when you then want to figure out, well, it might work, this one might work, but for whom, right? When you then break people out by that pre cost survey that only 10% of people took for that one condition that was already split up into four, we, there's basically not enough data. And I've, I've run into this multiple times uh, in my research. I've done several experiments in MOOCs. And what I've, what I've found to be a, a good way to, to, to proceed in that case is to have the same study run in several MOOCs and really coordinate with other researchers to, to try the same intervention or whatever it is that you're researching because that way you also get greater external validity by trying out in different materials with different populations that can be studied. And for that to work effectively, we need to come up with some standards. Uh, what, are the, what are the ways we, we categorize learners? What are the questions we ask them at the beginning to then be able to say, my learner population in this course looks like this, your learner population looks like that. Let, let's, let's see what the differences are in certain groups. Let's, let's see how we can match them to make some causal claims or quasi-causal claims. Uh, I think it would be good to, to come up with some standardized, uh, standardized metrics that we use to do that. 
So we're about out of time. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll end with sort of my final, here's a final pitch for why I'm particularly interested in disciplinary learning. Um, and, and, it, and it just has to do with sort of the sociology of groups. So, so my read of what's happened you know, across K-12, but also across higher education, is that, when, is that you, you don't change faculty, you don't change university, you change tribes. Um, as I think about the kinds of influence that I could have, you know, which is extremely limited over Harvard faculty, I think the odds of my research, no matter how good it is, no matter how certainly might come up with, of sort of changing faculty practices, I'm not sure that faculty change their practices in, re in reaction to new truths coming out of educational research. I think the primary thing that changes people's practices is when they see people in their tribes doing research that finds new practices and things like that, um, and whether that tribe is statisticians or biologists or physicists or humanists or social scientists or whatever it is, I think, I think maybe one other kind of case for disciplinary learning is that, I, is that I ultimately think the people who adopt a bunch of these best practices, it's not going to be across whole fields. It's going to be in very particular disciplines. And so the possibility then exists that if you can say, here's an impact that we had in statistics courses. Here's an impact that we had in public health courses. Here's an insight that we had um, in public policy courses. Um, it, it might actually be a better vector for change to think about sort of changing one tribe at a time rather than trying to change universal, you know, rather than trying to find universal truths and convince universal faculty um, to, to adopt them. So that'll be my sort of, that's my, my, I'll leave you with that final pitch for design research in the core, which may be, that argument may be wrong, but thinking about one of the things we came to is not just how do we do this research, but how do we do this research in a way in which it actually leads to changes in practices. Um, and there may be, there may be ways that we, that we rethink our research strategies as we start thinking about the final mile um, to how we get uh, you know, the, the modal teacher in the modal classroom to adopt the insights that would be, that would be most useful. Well, thanks for sharing these conversations. Um, if you want to keep chatting with me, I'm, here are all the slides I didn't do because the slides are boring. Um, so uh, you can find me in all these kinds of places, um, and, uh, and I'm happy to continue the conversation. Thanks for spending some time with me.